Welcome back. It's time for our first hot topic. President Bola Tinubu's tax regime is set to take off as he inaugurates a committee on fiscal policy and tax reform to be headed by Taiwo Oyedele. Multiple taxation have over the years stifled business growth in the organ with the organized private sector asking for review of um, friendly fiscal policies of the past administration. Nigeria ranks low on the global ease of paying taxes, while the country's tax-to-GDP ratio is one of the lowest in the world and below the African average. We're going to take a look at this right now, and I've been joined by Frank Elianya, technology and media news editor, Business Day newspaper. Good morning to you, Frank. Good morning. Happy to be on the show this morning. Glad to have you join us. So, Frank, it's 57 days in the life of this administration. Let's start with the level of faith you have in the direction of the economic plans of this administration so far revealed. Right. Yes. So, there's a bit of optimism in the market about uh, the president's uh, uh, policy so far. It has been uh, swift and it has been back-to-back uh, -back in coming. And uh, so, therefore, a lot of people have uh, uh, expressed optimism um, that um, maybe the economy um, might soon be on its path to growth. Um, also, the recent appointment of uh, Taiwo Yedele from uh, um, PwC to head uh, the task com uh, committee of the presidency um, have also uh, um, sounded a positive note, if you like, um, with the um, market. So um, it, it, it looks as if there's a lot of movement happening. The only the challenge is that um, that movement seemed not to be translating um, down to the uh, man on the street. Um, every other person out there don't feel like anything is happening. And uh, it, it's, it boils down to impact of the policies, how far, how far reaching. So uh, it, 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 I think we have to give it time to see what happens. But uh, um, there's a lot of optimism and we spread uh, and we explain it. Um, expect that this might translate to the general well-being of the citizen. All right. So this committee have said that they do not so seek to impose new taxes, but they are concerned with improving on collection and compliance management. However, um, public perception is key in, in, in them being able to achieve whatever they're seeking to achieve. And indeed, there is need for them to be swift and very effective, as you have said. But also, you have the FIRS plans to introduce VAT for the informal sector. So put this side by side. How is it going to work? Correct. How, how is that going to work? Um, I, I, I think there needs to be a lot more clarity with um, the communication of the government. Um, then, or there needs to be an alignment, um, so to speak. You can't be saying something on the other side and then um, the other side of you is doing something else. And that's why on this show we've always, uh, I've always said there needs to be um, a, um, a, a perception that the president is walking the talk. Um, sometimes his policy makers are, are saying something else. He, he is saying another thing, you know. Um, but I don't think anybody in the market, whether you're an investor, whether you're a business person, will um, think that this government uh, has any plan to reduce taxation or maybe um, uh, uh, um, make businesses pay less or something. I think um, the direction that we have seen so far with the government is uh, revenue generation. They want to increase um, the amount of money that Nigeria has, and uh, which is why um, one of the first policies that he looked at was the fiscal um, fiscal policy measures. 
um, where he removed uh, some taxes and also um, approved others and uh, all that that um, that fiscal policy measure should be implemented swiftly you know so that gives you a sense that this government is after um, increasing the revenue and there is a sense you know to that uh, or um, it, it is it is something that should be done we should increase our revenue but then um, the question is always at the expense of what and also when you're increasing revenue what is in it for the business community was in it for the consumers um, who are going to be um, assessing these uh, services and products that these businesses are coming out with you know so um, there has to be an alignment again I, I, I repeat um, between what the government says and what it brings out there um, so I, I think that sometimes sometimes the government um, looks at the wrong picture for instance if you're if you're looking at uh, the banking sector and some of the profits that they have been uh, reporting um, they, um i think it was this morning business they reported that the uba um has uh, um increases profits all right if you if, if if you look at it from the financial sector you will think that this this uh, economy is making a lot of progress or something is happening that is positive um with the economy but then you look at also the manufacturing sector or or the uh, the FMCG sector. That's where you see the real picture of what some of these policies have have done to the um, to the revenue of many companies. For instance, um, uh, Union Union Lever um, just reported uh, the other day um, that it lost about seventy two percent of its profit. All right, and its operational cost has increased significantly. Um, what where it was earning, say, about 200 million uh, as profit, the operational cost has increased to 3.2 billion naira. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's that, that is massive, and that gives us a better picture of how some of these policies have affected um, the, the, the sectors that help us make um, and production happen. Indeed, the organized private sector, uh, you know, are struggling to stay afloat. And as you have rightly alluded, Nigerians are overwhelmed, presently overwhelmed. Uh, we saw the protest in Benin City yesterday. And um, there is no doubt that this government has its work cut out for it. Um, in signaling its intentions, you know, in building this economy and providing making job opportunities available. So whatever this team being set up has to do, as I said earlier, they need to be very swift and very effective about it. How swift do you think they should be? Uh, the, okay, so they need to... Uh, this swiftness should have started a, a long time ago, if you ask me. Um, but then I worry that no matter how much um, good intentions the people that are being employed to do some of these things um, uh, have, um, their speed will only be determined by the speed of the man at the center of it all. If the president is not running as fast as he should, um, looking at the current state of the economy, those who he has employed to help him to run alongside him will not be able to run as fast because he will be dragging them um, backward. Um, look at the fact that um, it's over 50 days and we don't have minister uh, um, the ministerial lists yet to, uh, um, to go to the National Assembly. Um, we don't know the make of the people. We don't know who they are. We don't know uh, what vision that they are coming with. We don't know what direction that they will want to take us uh, to. You know, that for me is a concern. In fact, in fact a very real concern. Um, you, um, because I was thinking by now, we should have a minister of uh, petroleum, a minister of education, a minister of... Uh, uh, of or, of our Greek and other ministries, you know, so it, it should have happened a long time ago. I I've argued in the past that the latest that I expect a government or a president that wants to work to release ministerial list is a month into office. 
you don't have any business waiting beyond that. You don't, because already you have spent about three months before you were sworn in to know who it is that's going to be your ministers. The governors that you were waiting upon have already been sworn in. So they already have their own list of people that they want to bring to you, and you have to vet it, you have to uh, um, ask questions or go back to um, go back and forth with them, you know. But by now, we should have seen the ministerial list. And I'm also very, very um, disappointed that um, the, 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 um, the focus appears to be on revenue, the focus appears to be on uh, how to uh, um, boost oil sector and all that, but we are not doing much about human development um, sector. The education sector has there's no plan yet as to where the government wants to be except the um increase increase in uh increase in school fees that we heard the other time and all that i think that's not even what the um um focus should be at this moment you're not thinking about increasing school fees no matter what the argument is that we should uh, um these schools should end better so that they will increase the infrastructure whatever and all of that no what you should be thinking about, first of all, is what reforms should we bring to the education sector? And that should have led to the speed of bringing out a person who will lead the education sector. So by now, we should be thinking about how do we uh, um, reposition our young people? Because that is, that is where the asset is. It's not in the oil. Oil will, will be there, but if you grow your people, Look at what we're talking about now. We're talking about Jack Ma, We are talking about people who are leaving the country. And many of them don't have any hope of coming back or even contributing into the economy. But imagine that we were intentional about growing our people. We we're intentional about uh, um, their, their welfare, their education, you know, that even if they, they leave the country, many of them will want to come back because they know that there is something being built up for them. But right now, we don't have a direction in the education sector. We don't have a vision for it. And so for me, that's a very big minus for the government already. So the speed, talking about the speed again, um, will only be determined by the direction the president goes. It's not about who he employs. He can employ um, the, a first class um, graduate from Harvard. But if he does not move at the speed of that first class graduate, nothing changes until that happens. Constitutionally, it has 60 days to give us the list of ministers, to let us know those that are going to work with him. And today, as I started, 57 days. So he has three more days to go. Why do you think he's been this slow? Because one, those who voted for him had said that, oh, well, with the kind of things he did in Lagos and being an economist himself, that he, he would hit the ground running. Um, do you see, uh, do you, have you been able to um, pinpoint the reasons why it's taken President Tinubu this long to show us his team? Okay, so um, talking about what he did in Lagos, the jury is still out on that um, because for me, I think the only thing he did in Lagos was about uh, just raising revenue and uh, taxing and taxing and taxing. I don't see any significant infrastructure that's happened there, but the jury is still out on that. But um, looking at do I what what is holding him back? I think it's just mere politics. Um, I I think it's politics, and I think. It also speaks to the fact that perhaps he wasn't so prepared um, coming to office um, it, it, because it, it looks to me like he was more in tune with the politics, trying to, all, all he did was trying to get himself there by any means necessary. So he got himself in there. So whatever happens, just happens, you know. So he's just running along with, with the crews. Um, the tide is coming, so it's now time to do a ministerial appointments. So he needs to do that. Uh, and I've also heard people who said that it is, um, that the delay for ministers is also was delaying um, um, the appointment of commissioners in Lagos. I, I don't know how true that is, you know, but um, if, if that is the case, then um, him delaying the ministerial um, list um, is also affecting governance in other places. O okay, so um, what I think is that uh, um, whatever his reasons are, 
this is not even the time to even play politics right now. Um, we have said before that what is needed are people with the mind to work, people who are ready to roll up their sleeves, people who know that there's an urgency, that there is a crisis, in fact, a deep crisis in the country. People are suffering, and it is a real suffering. It's not, it's not, it's not just a, a, um, something. And given the fact also that um, right now we know that there is no refinery that is ready to refine any crude at, at this point, then it becomes more urgent for him to start thinking seriously about who is going to head the ministries. You know, um, the Dagote refinery I heard yesterday has been shifted the, um, to 2025. I don't know how true that is. And then, of course, um, the the three refineries that the government, the past administration said they were trying to complete uh, by March 2023. March has come and gone. Maybe the gold post has also shifted to another year, another we don't know about that. But if we don't get crude into the market, the price of crude will continue to go high. And that's also how the price of products in the market will also continue to go high. So there needs to be a cushioning for people who are bearing the brunt of all these harsh policies that the government is ruling out day by day. You know, and what that requires is somebody at the helm of affairs to walk the talk. We have said before, it is it is important for him to show us that he is also making the same sacrifices. He's not making it at this time. We're not seeing that sacrifice, all right? We're not seeing the court cutting. And court cutting goes beyond just saying, let us merge some ministries. Because you can merge ministries and still create a lot of portfolios for people to come and, uh, and, uh, and, and reap benefits from. If you're merging ministries, what, you're, what you should be thinking about is how do you then reduce the personnel cost from merging? All right. So that is what we expect. And then we're also expecting a review of the salaries of those who govern us, the, the, the lawmakers, the um, ministers, the president himself. We need to have, have an account. Let us know exactly what you're earning. OK. And I'm also I've also been asking myself, why is it that the president has not declared his assets? Mm. We need to know how much he, he got into office with and how much he has currently so that we know how much he's going to live with. And these things are clear. So if you want to lead this economy to the part of growth, you need to be you, you have to be transparent about it. And then you have to be accountable and make people hold you to account. All right. Well, these reforms that uh, well, this committee, uh, as I said, They've got their work cut out for them. The four executive uh, um, orders that were signed recently that are being applauded are temporary. Temporary. The organized private sector have been under heavy burden of multiple taxation. Local manufacturers are crying, crying to the heavens. Um, what would you say is the best way to encourage local production, increase internally generated revenue and and push, push the economy forward in addition to this committee that's been set up okay so um the first thing that should have been done is uh, looking looking at um the transportation let's start with transportation because i don't want to start with electricity because that, there's a lot hanging in there all right so you may not be able to unlock it immediately but look at transportation for instance can we provide um, a, a, um, a means of transportation for people um, or for businesses that helps them take their products from one end to another. Because right now, what appears to be the biggest, um, one of the biggest costs, not the biggest, one of the biggest costs for businesses now is transportation because the, the removal of petrol uh, subsidy lends itself directly to hike in transportation. All right. And uh, that takes me back to um, the auto gas auto gas fund um, that the um, that the past administrations wanted to start in 2020. Um, that fund essentially says that the government uh, plans to um, convert about a million vehicles, a million vehicles that includes buses, that includes um, different other vehicles, you know, uh, modes of transport, to um, to become gas. Uh, um gas driven all right so what that means is that they are also 
um, uh, um, renewable, they are clean, all right? But then it, it reduces our dependency on fossil fuels, all right? And when that happens, it means that um, the costs, the cost that people, that businesses are, are having to bear right now reduces, you know? So the plan was that by 2021, by 2021, we would have had at least 500,000 vehicles converted. Till today, that you and I are talking, that plan has yet to be implemented. And what are the issues? The issues is that the, the, the uh, process to assess the fund, the, the process to assess the uh, uh, Assess the fund. The fund is about, uh, I think, about 250 billion um, naira fund, right? The, the process to assess that fund is very tedious, and also the CBN has not helped matters because of all the documentation that they require uh, for businesses to submit, um, manufacturers to submit before they assess the fund. You know, so first of all, call the call the CBN and ask them what is holding back this policy. Can we roll it out in the next few few weeks? Okay, this is like a low-hanging fruit. You can start converting immediately. If you can convert about maybe say about ten thousand in every city, ten thousand in every city, and deploy it, you would have done a lot significantly to reducing the cost of transportation for both people and for the goods and services that will be carried on these um, vehicles. So it is it is time to look at what are the things that you can do quickly and do them immediately. You know, and then face um, electricity as well. L what are we going to do about our electricity? We need to increase the capacity. If we need to increase the capacity, let us increase the capacity. If we need to um, um, galvanize some of the governors to to um, to start investing in the electricity sector, let's let's do something. There needs to be some urgency towards energy generation. We need to start doing that. But first of all, start with transportation reduce the cost of carrying goods from one place to another then you look at electricity all of that can go side by side it, nothing stays that you must first of all finish one before you 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 go to the other one but if our focus is first of all how to make tasks generate tasks how to do other one and all that we are not looking at the right focus because look at people like uh, Unilever that has lost significantly their revenue how much incentive do they have to pay tax for the next quarter this is just a half year half year results that they have and they they've lost so much so how many more businesses are in their shoes and how many more businesses will want to pay the tax that you are organizing for so the first thing to do is how do you in um, ginger production how do you make people productive mm -hmm. again and transportation is a big um thing to do right now then you do electricity, then you can take it off from there. There are other things to do. Human, the HDI needs to be done, so, uh, as in, we need to do something about it. So all of that are things that government can look at at the interim while they do all they do to uh, bring out the ministers that we're, we've been waiting for. All right, thank you so much, Frank, for your time on this, uh, on the breakfast as we discussed this matter this morning. Thank you so much for your time, Frank. All right. Frank Eliana, Technology and Media News Editor, Business Day, has joined me to take a look at our very first hot topic. We'll take a break and come back for our second hot topic. Do stay with us.